we now study partial order relations. So recall that when we previously studied relations, we studied three properties, reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity. We now look at a fourth property. This is known as anti-symmetry. So let R be shown on set A. R is anti-symmetric if and only if for every A and B in the A, if A is related to B and B is related to R, then A is equal to B. Notice that what this is saying is that for every distinct element A and B, if A is related to B, then B cannot be related to A. So let's look at two relations here on the set of 0, 1, 2. R1 is the set of ordered pairs 0, 2, 1, 2, and 2, 0. R2 is the set of ordered pairs 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 1, 1, and 1, 2. We, went, we wish to determine whether these relations are anti symmetric. Now, just as when we were studying the properties of relations, when we're dealing with finite relations as we are here, so that is a relation on a finite set, it is easiest to look at the directed graph of the relation. So let's look at the directed graph R1. So we have three points. So let's plot 0, 1, and 2. All right, so we have for R1, 0 goes to 2. 1 goes to 2, and 2 goes to 0. So if we look at this, we can see that 0 is going to 2, and 2 goes back to 0. Well, 0 and 2 are distinct elements. So, this cannot be anti -symmetric. If we now look at the directed graph for R2, we again are going to plot the three points, 0, 1, and 2. So we have 0 goes to 0, and 0 goes to 1, and 0 goes to 2. Then 1 goes to 1, and 1 goes to 2, and that's it. What we can see here that 0 goes to 1, doesn't go to anything, but it doesn't go back. 1 goes to 2, but doesn't go back. 0 goes to 2, but the back. So here, R2 is anti-symmetric. Let's now look at a relation, or in this case, two relations on an infinite set. So consider the following relation. They're both going to be the division relation, the divide relation. The difference is that R1 will be acting on the set of positive integers. Where's R2? They'll be acting on the set of all integers. So for R1, if we look, we want to determine is it anti symmetric? So let's assume that A is related to B and B is related to A. So if A is related to B, that means that A divides B, which would mean there has to be an integer, call it Q1, such that b is equal to aq1. If b is related to a, then b divides a, which means there is an integer q2 such that a is equal to b times q2. So we can use simple substitution 
should say that B has to equal B times Q2 times Q1 or B times Q1 times Q2. So this would mean that Q1 times Q2 here would have to equal 1. Well, there's only two ways that can happen. They are both negative 1 or they are both positive 1. If they are both negative 1, then we have up here that B is equal to a negative number and A is equal to a negative number, which we can't have. This means that both Q1 and Q2 must be positive 1, and it would say then that B is equal to A, A is equal to B. So this seems to imply that R1 is indeed anti-symmetric. Now we just have to formally prove it. So let's suppose we have two positive integers A and B such that A is related to B and B is related to A. We have to show that A and B are the same. Well, this means then that A divides B and B divides A, which means we have two integers Q1 and Q2 such that b is equal to a times q1 and a is equal to b times q2. So we're going to use substitution. To take this a here, which is b times q2, and plug it in for this a right here. So we have b is equal to b times q2 times q1, which equals b times q1 times q2. And this means that q1 times q2 has to equal 1. So both q1 and q2 are equal to negative 1, or both q1 and q2 are equal it's a positive one. Right, however, Q1 and Q2 cannot be equal to negative 1 since A and B are positive. Therefore, Q1 and Q2 are both equal to positive 1 which implies that A is equal to B times 1, which is just B. So A equals B. This completes the proof that R1 is anti-symmetric. If we now think about R2. Well, now we're dealing with all integers. And what this would imply, this proof here, implies is that now... Q1 and Q2 could be negative 1, in which case we have B would be negative A and A would be negative B. So if we can think of two integers, negatives of each other, we have a counterexample. Right, so any two numbers would work as long as they're negatives of each other. So let's say A is positive 2 and B is negative 2. Well then 2 would equal negative 2 times negative 1 and negative 2 is equal to 2 times negative 1. So this means that 2 divides negative 2 And negative divides positive two. However, two is not equal to negative two, and so that is our counterexample for R two being anti-symmetric. Hence, R two cannot be. Right. So we now define what we mean by a partial order relation. Let 
R be a relation defined on some set A, we say that R is a partial order relation if and only if R is reflexive, anti-symmetric, and transitive. Now, recall that an equivalence relation was a relation that was reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. And so partial order relations are very, very similar, except that now instead of having to be symmetric, it has to be anti-symmetric. So one common example of a partial order relation is the subset relation. So if we have A being any collection of sets, the subset relation is defined as follows. For every u v in A, u is a subset of v, if and only if, for all x, if x is in u, then x is in v. All right, so we're going to go ahead and prove that this is a partial order relation. So there are three things we have to prove. We have to prove that it's reflexive. We have to prove that it's anti-symmetric. And we have to prove that it is transitive. So let's start with reflexivity. So we let u be any element in A, which is to say that U is a set. Well, remember, by definition, or it's not really definition, but remember we proved that every set is a subset of itself. Right? So because every set is a subset of itself. So it's reflexive. Now the proof of anti-symmetry. So we let U and Z be two sets in A such that U is a subset of V, and V is a subset of U. And remember, we have to show that U and V are the same. Well, this is just by definition. So this is by definition of set equality. U has to equal V. So it's anti-symmetric. Now the proof of transitivity. So we need three sets, so we say let u be x be three sets in A, such that u is a subset of v, and v is a subset of x. So for any a in U, A is in V, which means that A would be in X, which means that U is a subset of X, and so this is transitive, and the proof that this is a partial order relation is thus complete. So another common partial order relation is the less than or equal to relation. So let S be a subset of the real numbers. The less than or equal to relation on S is defined as follows. For all x, y in S, x is less than or equal to y if and only if x is less than y or x is equal to y. Right, so we're going to go ahead and prove that this is a partial order relation. So again, three things we have to prove. We have to prove it's reflexive, it's anti-symmetric, and it's trans. Start with reflexivity. So let x be an s. Now x is a real number. So 
x is equal to x, which would then mean that x is less than or equal to x. So proof of anti-symmetry. So let x and y be elements of s such that x is less than or equal to y and y is less than or equal to x. Now, since it is impossible for x to be less than y and y to be less than x, we have x is equal to y, which is what we wanted. So now, proof of, of transitivity. x, y, and z the elements of s such that x is less than or equal to y and y is less than or equal to z. Now, there are four cases we have to consider, right? x could equal y and y could equal z. x could be less than y and it could be less than z x could be less than or equal to y, while y is equal to z. And finally, x can equal y, while y is less than or equal to z. So we have to consider all four of these cases. Now, if x equals y and y equals z, then x would equal z, which would mean that x is less than or equal to z. If x is less than y and y is less than z, then x would be less than z, which implies that x is less than or equal to z. If x is equal to y and y is less than or equal to z, then what we do is we're going to use substitution to replace this y here with x. So then by substitution, x is less than or equal to, I'm sorry, this should not be less than or equal to, it should just be less than. x is less than z, which implies that x is less than or equal to z. If x is less than y, and y is equal to z, then again we'll use substitution. So we'll take this y here, which is z, and replace it here. So we have x is less than z, which means that x is less than or equal to z. So in all four cases, all cases, x is less than or equal to z. And the proof of transitivity is good. So, some notation. Since the less than or equal to played such a huge role in the study of partial order relations, the symbol, so this symbol here, is often used to refer to a general partial order relation. Now, when we were studying relations, we saw that we could use an arrow diagram or a directed graph, right? So an arrow diagram was used if we had a relation from one set to another different set. And the directed graph could be used when the relation was on just a single set itself. Now, if we're given any partial order relation defined on a finite set, it is possible to draw a directed graph in such a way 
and that there was a loop at every vertex. This is by virtue of the fact that it is reflective. All other arrows point in an upward direction. So this is by virtue of the fact that it is anti-symmetric. And at any time there's an arrow from one point to a second, and from the second point to a third, there is an arrow from the first point to the third. And again, this is by virtue of the fact that it's transient. Well, this would make it possible then to associate a somewhat simpler graph called a Hasse diagram with a partial order relation that's defined on a finite set. So, to obtain a Hasse diagram, we proceed as follows. We start with a directed graph of the relation, placing all of the vertices in such a way so that all arrows point upwards. Then we would eliminate the loops of all the vertices, eliminate all the arrows whose distance is implied by the transitive property, and then finally, eliminate the direction indicators on the arrows. So we're removing the axis. So we're going to consider the subset relation again on this, the power set of ABC. And we're going to construct the Hasse diagram for this relation. So let's begin by drawing the directed graph. So remember, we want to do this in such a way that all the arrows are pointing upwards. So since this is the subset relation, the very top point should be the original set itself, right? Because it will not be a subset of anything else except itself. Right? So, so then below that, we would have this all the subsets of ABC that are not subsets of anything other than themselves. Well, that would be this, all the sets of, that have two elements. So the set AB, the set AC, and the set BC. Then below that, we want the same thing, right? All possible subsets of these three sets that are not also subsets of anything else. So this would just be A, B, and C. And then below that, we want all the subsets, or all the sets that are that are subsets of this, of these three, that are not subsets of anything else. Well, there's only one set left, and that is the empty set. So since we know that this is a partial order relation, it's reflexive, I'm going to start by drawing loops. So we can just start by drawing loops at all the vertices. Now, Draw an arrow from the empty set to every set because the empty set is a subset of everything. Now let's look at the set of A. So I'm going to draw narrow to AB and then to AC because it is a subset of those two. The set B will have an arrow going to AB and an arrow going to BC. I'm sorry, there should also be an arrow going up to ABC, then from B, same thing, ABC. So from C, we're going to have an arrow that goes to AC an arrow that goes to BC, and then an arrow that goes to ABC. So AB will have an arrow that goes to ABC, AC will have an arrow that goes to ABC, and BC will have an arrow that goes to ABC. So this would be a direct.
So the Hasse diagram, we're going to draw the points in the same way. So that'll be a C up there. And right below that, we'll have three sets. A, B. A, C. B, C. Then below that, we're going to have three sets. A, B, and C. And then below that, we have the one set, the empty set. So, empty set is only going to go up one level. So we'll go up to A, we'll go up to B, and we'll go up to C. So A is going to only go up one level. So it'll go up to AB, and it'll go over to AC. B will go up one level. It'll go only to a, B, and then to B, C, and then C will go up one level, it'll go up to B, C, and A, C. And then each of these three will go up one level. All of them will go up to A, B, C. And so this would be the Hasse diagram. So that's this one right here. And that definitely looks a lot simpler, right, than this method. But we can also go in reverse. If we're given a Hasse diagram, we can also do or figure out its directed graph. So, again, begin by plotting the points in the exact same way. So, we'll say that's G there. This will be F here. Then we'll have D and E. And then we'll have A, B, and C. So let's begin by drawing the, the loops. On all the vertices. Alright, so we know that A is going to go to D. B will go to D. Okay. Now, B will also go to E. And C will go up to E. Now, D will go to F. However, since D went to F, A will have to go to F. And B will have to go to F. Now, E also went to F. Now we already have an arrow from B to F, so now we just need an arrow from C to F. And finally, F goes up to G. So anything with an arrow to F also has to have an arrow to G, so A has to go up to G. D has to go up to G. B has to go up to G. E has to go up to G. And C has to go up to G. And so here would be our directed graph for this Hasse diagram. Now, that is going to be it for a partial relation. Now, there are tons of applications of partial order relations in computer science. However, this video series is not going to go over any of those applications. It's really just introducing you to these concepts. So, in the next video, we will 
begin our study of functions.